All right, guys, welcome back to the Seiko's History. If you're here, it's because you've dealt with some part of the progressive era and some of the early reforms made at the, the local and the state levels. And now we're going to look at three progressive presidents today. So let's get it going here. All right. Uh, first of all, the, the, the first three, we call no, no them as progressive presidents. It really starts with Theodore Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, 1901 to 1909. He really kind of set the pattern for what was to follow. Uh, he leaves it off for four years for one of his friends and later enemies, William Howard Taft. 1909-1913, and then Woodrow Wilson brings it home and takes us through uh, through our World War One, and then our shift kind of focuses more to what's happening outside the country versus what's happening inside the country. So uh, there's Teddy, big teeth, Teddy, love him. Uh, William Howard Tab, big boy, there he is, and then we have uh, the skinnier gentleman, Woodrow Wilson. So we're going to start with Teddy and take you through what he does. First of all, his slogan is the square deal. All right, Roosevelt only became president when William McKinley was assassinated in Buffalo, New York in 1901 during the Pan-American Exposition. So Roosevelt claims to offer people a square deal. Why does he choose a square? It's uh, it's nice and even, and he was going to take care of employees, employers, corporations, consumers, children. He's going to offer everybody a, a fair shake or a square deal, as he called it, right? His administration is really known for the many reforms that took place, all right? So we're going to deal with consumer protection first. This is a nice little uh, kind of picture of William McKinley getting shot by Leon Cholgosh, who was an anarchist. And there's Leon Cholgosh. Uh, obviously, they, they caught him and he went to jail. Uh, that's, a, that's a story for another time. So let's deal with consumer protection, all right? Uh, the first thing is, is that um, Upton Sinclair was a muckraker. You should have learned about him already. He wrote a novel known as The Jungle. Roosevelt recognized the need for consumer protection after reading this book, all right? And out of that, he urges Congress to create what's known as the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act and then the 1906 Meat Inspection Act. Both of these laws made sure that the products that we were eating were safe and that uh, consumers, if they bought something, they, they weren't going to get sick. So if you saw this, there's Teddy. There's a huge meat scandal. It stinks. He can't breathe it. There is an investigation. And who we got to call? We got to call Congress right here. That's not the White House. That's Congress to make sure that laws are made to stop this from happening. So if you don't know what consumer protection is, you got your vocab there. And then square deal with some of the name given to Roosevelt's programs to treat everybody equally. So uh, he does step in and regulate business. So he really wanted to strengthen regulating the railroads because they were involved in, in practices that weren't in the public's favor. So he really pressures Congress to pass the Elkins Act, 1903. And what it does is it actually increases is the power, the viability of the Interstate Commerce Commission. Once again, that thing came around in 1887, and it was the first regulatory agency. So what could they do? They were given the power to set railroad shipping rates, so just to make sure that the rates that these railroad companies were, were issuing were fair to consumers, all right? Uh, a couple years later, he comes out with the Hepburn Act with Congress, and it's going to give the ICC even more power. So what the ICC could not regulate were pipelines, ferries, bridges, and certain railroad terminals because all of those products are traveling between multiple states. So once again, is the Interstate Commerce Commission, all right? Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was certainly not in favor of large companies who were doing things not in the public good. So he really, he's going to distinguish between two different ideas of trust. If you forgot what a trust was, once again, it is a form of a monopoly. So it is a way for a company to control the pricing on a particular product. He said, well, good trust... Um, are just going to be regulated and we're going to keep an eye on them. Bad trusts, trusts that are doing things that are harming people will be dissolved. Their companies will be broken up because they broke a law. And you should remember the law that is the Sherman Antitrust Act. So uh, Roosevelt, what he also does is convince Congress in 1903 to form the Bureau of Corporations. It will later become the president's cabinet position the Department of Commerce and Labor. So there's an image of Teddy. Once again, bad trust. He's going to shoot him. He's going to break those companies up. Good trust. 
You see he's got the little restraint on there. He's going to keep an eye on them. And we're not too sure about this company yet. It hasn't really grown up. So there's a great political cartoon about uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, one particular company was the Northern Securities. Northern Securities was a railroad company that had established a monopoly. So it happens in the late 1800s. And uh, they're up in the Pacific Northwest. And they're charging more for their product than they should. So in 1901, the Justice Department used this. The Sherman Antitrust Act. They prosecute this company because they were violating the law. Teddy Roosevelt was the first president to do that, right? So the Supreme Court is going to be ruling on this case, and they actually come out and say the company needs to be dissolved into smaller railroad companies to create competition so prices go down. So uh, you got Uncle Sam. The Sherman Antitrust Act is stopping these railroads from doing things they shouldn't be doing. Nice little political cartoon there, right? So Teddy is regulating uh, businesses. He's making sure we are protected as consumers. What does he do for labor? If you need antitrust uh, vocabulary, it's there for you. What does he do for labor? Well, he achieves many important reforms for the working class, all right? Uh, the biggest is going to be a coal strike. So there is a coal strike in Pennsylvania. Uh, a bunch of workers decide that they're going to go on strike because they're working too many hours and not making uh, enough money. Uh, and the coal miners will not negotiate with them. They're not going to give them their demands, right? Roosevelt takes over. He basically calls the mine owners and he says, listen, if you don't figure this out, I'm going to send in the army. And the owners say, hey, we will submit to something known as arbitration, where, where two sides can get together to tell what they want, and then a third party will determine their fate. Well, what did the mine workers actually get? They actually won some of their demands. Did they get everything? No, but they won some of them. So they did get a shorter workday. They got the workday down to 10 hours, and they got a small pay raise. So they were able to go back to work and get the coal because the country needed it. But why is the anthracite coal strike in 1902 so important? It is the very first time the federal government stepped in to help the workers and not the owners, not the managers. So uh, this is kind of a step in the, uh, the right direction. So why is Teddy getting involved? Because the country, Uncle Sam, we need what? Coal. So he wants to end this strike and get those coal workers back to work. And there's there's arbitration right here. So I'm going to tell you what I want. I'm going to tell you what I want. And the guy in the middle, the arbiter, is going to make that decision. Uh, and the idea of arbitration is you, you both agree going into it that whatever the third party decides, you both are going to do it. So thank you. The workers finally got a raise there. So collective bargaining is something that was done in the coal strike. It's the process of a union or a bunch of workers negotiating with the owners for demands for a con for a contract. So that's fine. Employers' liability. Well, before we get into it, what was the problem in the workplace? People were getting hurt, and the employers didn't care. So the main goal here is to make the employers assume some responsibility for keeping the workplaces safe, clean, so that you don't get hurt, right? And uh, if you did get hurt, maybe the, the owner was liable. Maybe they had to pay you some damages because you were injured on their property, right? So the Employer's Liability Act basically says we're going to provide accident insurance if you get injured on the job. So if you get hurt on the job, it, the, the company may be the ones having to pay for your pain and suffering uh, and, and you getting hurt. So conservation is a, another big issue for Teddy Roosevelt. If you need to know what conservation is, get the vocabulary. I'm going to keep cruising here. So Teddy Roosevelt was an outdoorsman. He loved to hunt. He loved the outdoors. And he saw that our nation was destroying our national resources. So what he wanted to do was conserve some of them. He wanted to, to take some areas and say, hey, we're not going to touch that stuff. So there's a series of legislation that, that comes out here. So the first is the Forest Service Act. 1891. Teddy doesn't do this, but it's put in place before him. 150 million acres of public lands are placed under federal protection. And they're telling private companies they can't touch them. All right. What Roosevelt does is say, hey, that was a good idea. I want to add more land to that. So he had tripled the amount of land set aside for national forests, national parks, wildlife places, and other national monuments. Okay. The other issue he worries about is our water. So the National or the Newlands Reclamation Act really is going to use federal money to build dams 
irrigation system in the West so we can make sure we get water to the people that need it. Everybody should have access to fresh water. And uh, he really takes care of that out west. Why is it a big deal out west? The west is a drier area than, than certainly you're living around the Great Lakes. Okay. Uh, what he also did was he got a bunch of states together to chat about what was to be done. So he held a conservation congress in 1908, right before he left the presidency. Uh, a bunch of naturalists, conservationists, 44 governors showed up to discuss how are we going to handle our land. Okay. Uh, keeping on with uh, conservation, he, you know, knowing about who he was. He was a, a naturalist. He's interested in conservation, protecting our environment, protecting our, our wilderness lands and the animals inside of them. So before Teddy, what was the government doing? They were giving lands to private people, farmers, businesses, railroads, colleges, and they were using that land. Well, after Teddy, what's the new new modality of the federal government? They're going to take some land and keep it. So it is protected by who? The federal government. All right. So you got your before and you got your after. Teddy was definitely influenced by two of his buddies who were conservationists. Gifford Pinchot, who became the head of the U.S. Forest Service, and John Muir, Founder of the Sierra Club, helped create Yosemite National Park. John Muir, I think you got a picture of him here for you. Uh, here's Jiffer Pinchot, conservation hero. Uh, there's John Muir. And there's Teddy, the Grand Canyon, hanging out with his buddy, John Muir. So once again, these guys are going to do one thing and one thing only. Take a bunch of land and let it be known that it is protected by the federal government and that land cannot be touched. Um, we're going to take a look at all of the federal legislation for Teddy. A nice quick hit here. You might want to pause this so you get them all, right? Uh, we know the Sherman Antitrust Act outlawed monopolies. It said that they were certainly illegal. The National or the Newlands Reclamation Act made sure that people had access to fresh water. Department of Commerce and Labor would be interested in researching and looking into labor issues in terms of uh, the conditions that people were working in. The Elkins Act and the Hepburn Act both gave the ICC more and more and more power. Forest Service, the United States Forestry Service, they established our nation's water and timber resources. So they put regulations on um, timber and lumbering companies. So if you cut down a tree, maybe they're going to force you to plant one or two of them. So we still have trees. In the late 1906 is, uh, you know, what happened after Teddy Roosevelt read the jungle, right? You got your Pure Food and Drug Act and then the Meat Inspection Act. So when you look at Teddy, uh, and we talk about his square deal, he's doing a pretty good job, all right? So let's take a look at Wilson. Uh, I'm sorry, well, William Howard Taft here. So progressivism under Taft. Roosevelt is president for eight years. He probably would have been president again, but he decides he's not going to run. That's not what George Washington would have wanted. So William R. Tab became president with the support of Teddy Roosevelt and his whole progressive party. Uh, what does Taft do? Well, Taft is interested in breaking up trust. So Taft and the Justice Department brought twice as many suits against big companies that uh, compared to what Roosevelt did. So Roosevelt broke up about 44 trusts. Taft is going to break up around 92. So those will be the numbers for you. Uh, the biggest of it, which is what? Standard Oil Company, right? So the monopoly should be dissolved, says Taft. And the Supreme Court applied the rule of reason here. And they said, listen... If it is unreason, if a business is unreasonably combining with other businesses to create this giant monopoly, we're going to break it up. If the business has reasonable combinations and uh, the business isn't really engaging in, in any type of practices that are hurting consumers, we're going to leave it alone. Right. So, uh, other reforms is uh, dealing with the ICC under Taft. He actually uh, Teddy Roosevelt signed the Elkins Act. Taft will sign the Mann-Elkins Act, which will give the ICC the power to regulate any communications companies such as telephone, telegraph. Today, you would add internet in there. Why? Those products are going between multiple states. Okay. Um, the 16th Amendment was proposed by Congress under William Howard Taft. It doesn't happen until 1913, but he does propose it. And that's why I make the X like that. 16th Amendment says that our Congress, our federal government can collect income taxes. Right? So 
uh, just showing you a little restraint here, railroad restrictions. I'm going to tell these railroads what they can and can't do with the Man Elkins Act and the ICC. So, a couple of issues for Taft, though. He wasn't as strong as a progressive as Teddy would have wanted. So, let's take a look at what he does. Republicans wanted to raise tariffs. Progressives wanted them to go down. So if you could just remember that, that's great. If there's an issue with the tariff, the progressives want the tariff to go down. So what does Taft do? He signs a law. It's a nice law. The Payne Aldrich Act of 1909 actually begins to raise the tariff a, a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. And Taft anger progressives. He said it was the best thing we ever did. Well, what do progressives want? They want the tariff to go down. And what does Taft do? He raises it, right? The Republican Party is split. So Tav continues to do what he wants to do, and Roosevelt is so upset, he creates his own political party, known as the Bull Moose Party, or the Progressive Party, and he's going to go against his old buddy, William Howard Tav, right? Uh, and there's kind of Tav, he's kind of rolling through with his, uh, his administration, he's got all his cats, he seems to be getting tangled up, and Roosevelt's like, what are you doing? I set you up with this whole progressive agenda, and you've done screwed it up, right? So some more problems for Taft, a couple of little issues, right? If you can remember, what was Teddy Roosevelt doing with public lands? Conserving them. Well, what does Taft do? He fired this guy, Jifford Pinchot, one of Ta uh, Teddy's buddies. And then Taft's secretary of the interior, Richard Ballinger, he sold a whole bunch of land to private companies. Well, what did those private companies do with that land? They weren't conserving it. No, they started cutting down trees, digging for oil, digging for gold and silver, raising cattle, and Roosevelt and the progressives are so angry, right? So if you want to take a quick peek at Taft, there's not much there because, once again, he is only there for four years. So you have the Man Elkins Act, once again, giving the ICC more power. You have the Department of Labor, which set up that Department of Commerce and, and Labor for the uh, federal government so they can keep an eye on labor issues. And then it was passed by Congress in 1909. It will not be ratified till 1913, but our Congress can collect an income tax. So you should be aware of that. So uh, our last president, Woodrow Wilson, what's he in there, right? Uh, Taft it, it cannot win re-election. He's going to be challenged by his own political party, Teddy Roosevelt, and Woodrow Wilson. So Eugene Debs was in the election, but he garnered uh, a very small percentage of that, uh, that electoral vote. So when you look at it, once again, look at the electoral vote. Woodrow Wilson is a Democrat. He will win by a large margin. Obviously, the popular vote was pretty close. Uh, Teddy, uh, Teddy Roosevelt actually gets more electoral votes than even William Howard Taft. But really what happens here, these two individuals split the vote and Woodrow Wilson is able to walk away with the election. So what does he do? What are his financial reforms? Let's take a peek. First of all, Wilson was a progressive and he decides to do the right thing. Uh, in 1913, he passes a law known as the Underwood Tariff Act. And of course, if you can remember the Underwood Tariff Act, it does just that. It lowers the tariffs. And that's what progressives wanted. He also was responsible for being the president when this was ratified. And it is a graduated income tax. Once again, it is the 16th Amendment. I wrote out 16 so you can remember that X, right? If you make more money, you pay more taxes. If you make less money, you pay less taxes. So it is actually called or referred to as a progressive income tax. As you progress and make more money, you are going to pay more taxes. So that's one, that's two things he really did in terms of our money. Uh, 16th Amendment is what? Taxes, just so you can see it. The other thing that he does, and this is huge, he sets up the Federal Reserve System. He wanted a system to keep an eye on the federal government's money. So what he did was he organized our national banking system into 12 districts. Well, why does he do it? The federal government now could keep track of its money keep track of money in circulation, issue new money if it needed, control the amount of money that's circulating. If our economy begins to dip, the Federal Reserve will be in charge of controlling its interest rates, either raising them or lowering them. And it can move money from one bank to another to make sure that there's not too much money in one section of the country. And the Federal Reserve System, by the way, is still around today.
All right. Uh, what do they do? They do two things, right? They lower interest rates to stimulate the economy or they raise interest rates to control inflation. So the Federal Reserve Board tweaks interest rates and controls the money that's in circulation. Those are the two big things the Federal Reserve does. So uh, what does Wilson do with business? Well, he sets up the FTC, and it is still around today. It is the Federal Trade Commission. And what it did was it investigated businesses that were engaging in practices that were unfair. And it basically told those companies, if you're doing something wrong, we're going to fine you, we're going to hunt you down, and we're going to impose sanctions on you. Usually fines or maybe even shut a business down. The commission investigated false advertising and mislabeling. So if you buy a product today in America, the label is absolutely correct because the federal government is watching what branch or what arm of the federal government, the Federal Trade Commission. The other thing Wilson does is he gives a little more bite to the Sherman anti Trust Act. So what does he come up with? The Clayton Antitrust Act. And it gave the government even more power to regulate businesses. It stopped the idea of companies price fixing, forming or buying stocks and other firms. And it just stopped some of the illegal activities that businesses were doing simply so they could make money. But at the same time, it hurt us, the consumers, right? Uh, the act actually tried to end the practice of using antitrust lawsuits against usins, but the Supreme Court was severely undercut that idea till the 1930s. All right, um, and antitrust violations were alleged against large companies like AT and T and Microsoft when they tried to get together. Okay, few other little reforms under Wilson, and then we'll wrap this thing up for you. All right. The Adamson Act set an eight-hour workday for workers on railroads and interstate commerce. So that is a nice idea if you're working for the federal government or if you're working in interstate commerce, but it didn't really hit everybody yet. So I have to fix that eight-hour workday. Uh, the Federal Farm Loan Act said, hey, we're going to make lower interest loans to farmers so they can pay their bills and they can continue to farm. Because if farmers aren't farming, we lose food, right? The Keating Owen Child Labor Act, another nice one, tried to outlaw child labor, but the Supreme Court ruled that law unconstitutional. So it will be a few years into the 1930s till the federal government steps in and says, hey, uh, child labor is illegal, right? Uh, what else happened under Wilson? The, 19, uh, the, sorry, the 18th Amendment was ratified in 1919. That is your prohibition amendment, the 18th. So if you can't make it, you can't sell it, you can't transport it, you can't drink it, you can't have it. Liquor is illegal, all right? And then the other great, great stride for women would be the, what, the 19th Amendment of 1920 actually gave women the right to vote. So you have some, some serious reform with Taft, uh, Teddy, and now uh, Woodrow Wilson. So if you need that, that vote cap, snag it. What are the laws under Wilson? There's a lot of them. 16th, remember, is the tax. 17th Amendment, we are going to directly elect our senators. We dealt with that under political reform. Underwood Tariff, what does it do with the tariff? Makes it lower. Federal Reserve Act creates the Federal Reserve Board. They're going to keep an eye on interest rates and keep an eye on the money supply. FTC, make sure businesses are doing what they are supposed to do, right? Clayton Antitrust Act gave the Sherman Antitrust Act more power. It allowed them to do more, right? Uh, the National Park Service, not mentioned earlier, but uh, it was created to take over the administration of all the nation's parks to make sure that they're still there today like they were 100 years ago, right? 18th Amendment, no booze. Can't manufacture it, transport it, sell it, nothing, right? 19th Amendment, women finally gained the right to vote. And then you have the nice, in 1920, also to have the women, the Women's Bureau, created within the Department of Labor to promote the status of working women and make sure that there was clear, uh, good working conditions for women. So uh, what happens to the progressive era? Some people say it ended. Some people say it, it will continue. Well, uh, I, I think as a society, we always strive to get better. So the progressive era will continue. But why is this time period known as this progressive era? Because we made so many far-reaching, sweeping changes 
to make life better for Americans. So, and what happened in 1917, our priorities really shifted from what was happening at home to what was happening outside of our borders, and we ended up getting sucked into World War One. So we will, we will take a peek at that uh, in a later chapter. So good seeing you. I hope this helped, and uh, make sure you study.